as a special edition, I want to welcome to the stage a journalist and best-selling author who in 2011 went undercover in North Korea, posing as a missionary and as an English teacher to the sons of North Korean elites, came out and wrote an astounding book about it. Please welcome to the stage for a conversation with this journalist and best-selling author, Suki Kim. <laughs> Hi, Suki. Suki, I just gave away a little bit of your, uh, your biography and your astounding story, uh, which I, I, as a journalist, a foreign correspondent, I went to some of these similarly dangerous, oppressive places, but never making anything like the commitment that you made or taking the level of risk that you took. And the fact that we're here at the museum, which is meant to be something of a monument to the best of journalism, first of all, I have to congratulate you for what you did. Uh, and I also want to understand where, where the compelling interest came from. You started visiting North Korea uh, back in 2002, and you made this trip to where you lived for six months, basically undercover in 2011. Where did the compelling interest come from? Well, I mean, professionally, um, it was very obvious when I first went in in 2002 which I went in uh, by joining a pro-North Korean organization that's based in New Jersey, of all the places. <laughs> um, so I joined them, and I went in for Kim Jong-il, who was the then great leader, whose current great leader, Kim Jong-un's father. It's his 60th birthday celebration that I went in for. And um, I ended up doing a cover feature for the New York Review of Books. Um, early 2000 comes right at the end of the Great Famine of North Korea, which was the end of the um, 90s, and it was about a tenth of population had died. So by 2002... A tenth of the population. Uh, we approximate, right? Because you never astounding. know for... You, you can't verify the number mm. ever, but that's about how many people died. And North Korean population is 25 million. So they're counting about 2 to 3 million deaths. So uh, in 2002, when I went in, um, the devastation was pretty much just in your face, you know, I didn't expect anything to be this dire. And the then great leader's birthday is in February, which was freezing. And there was obviously, I mean, I slept with a coat on and I slept in the VIP uh, quarter back then because, you know, there just was no heat. But beyond that, I think it was this sense of what this world was, where you can't go anywhere, you can't say anything, there's nothing except a great leader. The thing that is anybody's nightmare was just in my face, and I needed to understand this. Like, what does this world mean? Mm -hmm. How do I understand it a little bit better? Also, topping that is the fact that I am Korean, and I was born and raised in South Korea, and my family was also separated by the Korean War. So there was a personal interest in sort of understanding just in a gut instinct what this might be, but professional instinct of trying to really, really get faction figure. And faction figure about North Korea is the one thing you cannot get, right? Which right. is why it took a decade of five visits to North Korea and finally being immersively, immersed journalism living in there. Just very briefly, you, you said that your family was affected by the division of the country. H who ended up where? On both sides of my family, my mother's brother uh, was taken to North during the Korean War, mm -hmm. which is 1950 and to 1953. That's what that war was. On my father's side, his cousins were taken. Um, they were all around 17 and 18, usually young people around that age. Uh, his cousins were nursing students. My mom's brother was just 17 year old. And um, those were, at the time, supposedly, first ones to be grabbed, because they're useful. But this is not that unusual. I mean, it's such a tragic reality. They never, on either side, they just never saw them again. But the, you know, it's not like they died. In my grandmother, my mother's mother's case, uh, he was taken away and she thought he was gonna come back next week. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like he died. People saw him being dragged to north, but because from Seoul to Pyongyang, if you drive that, it's a couple of hours. So it's so close. So, and suddenly they put this border there. And that generation just thought that whoever ended up on the other side would just come home next week because it's a temporary division. So every time there was a knock at the door, there was... You Literally, my grandmother never moved because when he comes home, he should walk home, you know, She'd walk know where in. the address is. Yeah, so... 
I mean, this is just not one. They are counting like a million plus separation, separated family members. So what that means is that entire generation was, there was a heartbreak that killed them because I believe that forced separation is very different from death because you're forever wondering what might have happened and you're also forever thinking there will be a closure. That person will come home. And to think that these mothers or sons who just basically waited and waited and waited and here we are 70 some years later. And, and, and just to be clear, in your case, the, the disappeared members of your family, you never did find out. We never found out. Where, where they are, if they're alive, if they're buried, where they're buried, nothing. There was one letter that supposedly came uh, my father's cousins through Japan of these women saying we're okay sometime in the 70s. And because of that, uh, my great aunt was always called to the, uh, like a CIA of Korea for possibly being a North Korean spy. But then she never heard anything since. And this is, I just want to stress, this is just not that unusual. You know, every other family in Korea has this story. So I think that when I look at the Korean divisions, you're asking me what drove me to it back the first time, 2002. Beyond the famine and gulag and all of that, it's also realizing a generation died this way, right? Like, because here we are now three generations later. So what does that mean? Because, you know, like in a movie, some answers are given. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always some closure happens, but what if that closure never came and that generation died without ever meeting again? And I think that as a writer, my job was to somehow deliver this reality to the world who doesn't know this part of North Korea. We always think about things like the crazy dictator and you know, like beyond all of that was actually a generation that Miss, that got missing. And, th and then you got this unbelievably distinct, unique look at the young generation. So in 2011, I want people to buy your book so that we won't <laughs> tell the whole story. But in 2011, the, the key plot is that you got a job teaching English. You passed yourself off as an English teacher at a school that specializes in teaching the sons of the power elite of North Korea. These are all the, the golden boys whose, whose parents are powerful and who are chosen to continue to be powerful. And interestingly, they learn English. And you went in there for six months. You know, you went in there as a journalist. That was your agenda, was to report, but you told everybody you were an English teacher. You, were, you spoke English every single day. You were not allowed to speak Korean. And that's the amazing part of the, the book, because if you were caught, you would not be sitting here now in all likelihood. Um, how, did, how did you get away with it? How did you pull it off? Well, I mean, it took, you know, as I was chasing after North Korea, which really is what I was doing from 2002. So I did, you know, everything you could imagine. I m interviewed so many separated families, uh, so many defectors in all the surrounding region, from China to Mongolia, Laos to Thailand. I mean, there's all these routes that defectors take. Not only that, I interviewed them in the hiding place to also, like, a, you know, a year after they've arrived in South Korea, to try to valid, like, verify how many of their testimonies might be true or might not be true. And so you do all this research, and I went to South Africa when the North Korea, do you remember when they qualified in the World Cup in 2010? I went there to try to understand who might be in the audience, for example, mm -hmm. who ended up being a contract workers from Namibia who were shipped there. Although the media then was reporting it were ch they were Chinese actors hired by the great leader. You know, the media always makes this stuff up. So I needed to understand from every, per every aspect of this country, the factors generally come from the bottom class. So you, from the border area of China. So trying to get to what is at the heart of North Korea. Also, another thing I realized is in 2008, I went in for Harper's Magazine to cover the New York Philharmonic concert, for example. And trying to cover North Korea by going there for a few days, it's just, you get a PR. Mm -hmm. message that the government wants you to go write about it and spread the world. And everything world. is wonderful and everybody lo you meet is happy and well-dressed. It's and all crafted. It's, it's all, you know, it's really like going to a Disney World and you are on a tour with a Cinderella, right? Yeah. Like, 
what is that? I mean, and that's the what that's the what they want you to tell the the world about it. But in this case, it's the world's most brutal regime. So if this is what they decided to show me, and I'm supposed to write that down, and I go out into the world and I tell the world this is what North Korea is, you've just done a PR for the regime's agenda. So then that's why it's really hard. So how do I get immersed in there? So I did try, you know, the the post. The Pyongyang University of Science and Technology is the school that I went in uh, pretending to be a, a passing myself off as an evangelical school teacher. I mean, that was not the only one. You know, there were different threads that I was kind of constantly joining and trying to get in there to live there. It's mm -hmm. the only one that worked out. And to write a book, you know, because I, I, it, was, it was years before where the book was decided what I was going to do in there. I just need to get in. So. Even until I went in, finally, I wasn't even sure if I would make it in there. Mm -hmm. But it turned out there was this odd, I found that first in 2008, I ended up going in in 2011. I was courting that organization for three years. And that university was being set up in the suburb of Pyongyang uh, by an international evangelical organization. And that evangelical organization had promised with the North Korean regime to not proselytize. Uh -huh. So basically, fundamental evangelical Christians were pretending not to be Christians in North Korea, and I was pretending to be a fundamental evangelical <laughs> who's pretending not to be evangelical Christian. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of so how So the I lying <laughs> begins. <laughs> and I mean, if it wasn't for that, I couldn't have gotten away with it. I've never read a Bible in my life, you know? And <laughs> And they actually were not allowed to even talk about Christianity ever. So who were these boys you were teaching? Men. It, I should, they were young they men. Were, they were young men. You know, when you read the book, it feels like they're a lot younger because being abused makes you infantilized. And that's one thing that was really, really, really very obvious more and more with my kids. You know, they were really 20-year-old young men. But a lot of times they could be eight. Um, that year, 2011, was also year 100 for North Korea because North Korea counts their calendar system differently from the rest of the world, officially at least. So 100th year, they could stay, if the great leader's birth, the original great leader I'm talking about, Kim Il-sung, he was the 100th year. So to celebrate this occasion, He was born said, in 1911, so it was 100 years, yeah. It was it, to sell, to they, in order to celebrate, they shut down all the universities in the whole country for a year. Mm -hmm. and put all the, plucked all the uh, top, uh, I mean, every university student and put them in construction field, which they said is to build a, a prosperous nation. So what they were doing is basically doing manual labor, all university students. Um, and then they plucked their creme de la creme, 270 of them, and put these young men into this school that his foreign evangelical people were, had built, brand new school. So in fact, the evangelicals around the world were funding the education of North Korea's elite. Wow. And that's where I ended up, in this military compound, which was 24 seven guarded, nobody was allowed to leave, and there were minders living right below my room, and they were just watching 24 seven. So, I did bring in the smallest USB sticks and I wore them around my neck like a necklace. And I kept all the notes on USB sticks and erased them from the laptop. You can have a laptop because if you're covered as an English teacher, you can have a laptop. But I also buried the documents within a document so it looked like an English lesson, but you know, from page 100, the book begins. So, uh, and then I would, I would have to erase it every single time because I wrote you know, really early in the morning and really late at night, and then just get rid of all the trace from that time in case they go through it. I mean, they were, you really have to go through so also. So you're living two lives, I mean. Also, you know, you have to have a backup. Imagine losing that, right? right. Because if once I, once I lose this document, what would have happened to me? So I had to have a backup on an SD card, and I hid it in the room because there was a, I didn't know if there was a camera. I knew the rooms were bugged, but I didn't know if the. Did you like your students? I loved them. And I think that it's complicated because, you know, I was a journalist looking at them as a subject. But at the same time, in order to be a really, really good immersive journalist, you also have to sincerely be there as a teacher. 
So my role, my way of surviving there, because it's, 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 it was unbearable to be there for multiple reasons. It was completely under surveillance 24 seven is a very exhausting way to be because you're always worried. You know, you're always, one thing that I, I remember doing was always going over what I might have said. I had to also eat with the students three times a day. And we have these conversations to practice English, but that conversation gets private sometimes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you might, you know, they might start talking about their girlfriend, which they might not, in the beginning they didn't. It was always about the great leader. And slowly they might <laughs> talk about the girlfriend. <laughs> they all said, we have um, no interest in girls. And these are 20 year old boys. Clearly they're lying. <laughs> But by the end, they would tell me, it's only for me, they would tell me about their girlfriend. So this kind of conversation, sometimes then you slip things in order to find out more about what's going on in this country. You know, how many channels of television? For example, they might ask me, you know, because North Korea only has one channel, really, that officially works, and that only shows the great leader programs. But Is that a good show? <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable how yes. many things you can say about the great leader, which is what that um, country does. It's the same thing over, it's a deja vu, it's a place like a groundhog day. It's really the, and I think that's the thing. And, you know, it it's so, looks so bizarre, I think, to the Western world. But in there, it's the same information that's being told over and over and over and over again. And to think this has been going on, not just for a year, not for five years, for 70 some years. That is all you get. There's only one channel, there's only one newspaper. You know, do, there's do, only but do, they, do these boys know what the outside world is about then? You see, I think this is where, you know, when we're trying to understand what North Korea is, first of all, uh, they didn't even know what the internet was. And they all said that they did, but they didn't. Uh, and they, it, there were majors where, it's a science and technology school, so their majors were computer. Why, how do I know that they didn't know what it was? Because they would ask questions that clearly, if you ask them, all of them say, I know exactly what it is. But then they'll say things like, how many movies can you watch, teacher, on your internet? Can you watch five movies or is it 10? And it's like, well, actually, <laughs> you can watch more than five movies on the internet. But I mean, you know, so it's things, for, things like this that you realize they don't actually have the concept. But when you think about it, would we have known what internet was for those of us here who remembers the world before the internet? You know, we don't, it's hard to explain that things. Mm -hmm. So, and how much do they know and how much do they not know? First of all, North Koreans cannot travel outside or within the country. There's a check post between each town. Everything is blocked. All the information you ever get is about North Korea. Education isn't really possible. My students didn't really know about a lot of things because Basically, they only get information about the great leader or anything is related to the great leader, why they learn these things. You can't really... You, but, but just to stop you for a second, when you talk, you refer to the great leader being the content a lot, uh, the TV shows, but what about just music and... Uh, and but the great, well, I mean, that's the funny thing about it. I think, I remember thinking this when I went to cover the New York Philharmonic and there was a New York Philharmonic playing the Gershwin, right? Or right now we heard, we saw the K-pop stars going in there perform for the elite of North Korea. But in reality, for average person in North Korea, music is about the great leader. You know, Seriously, it's a world the songs where, are all, yeah. right, it's, it's either the theme is the great leader or it's written by the great leader. You know, it's a little bit, you know, the, may, maybe a better way to think is like, maybe you don't really imagine Beatles being played inside a church. People don't sing songs, rock and roll inside a church, right? It's kind of like that. Like all the music is about the great leader, and any books, any idea, concept is about the great leader. How, how does North Korea expect to prepare itself for a future if its generation of star students is, you know, they're learning English, but they don't know anything in a certain way. They don't know anything. If you want your citizens, that's why I mean, the, the, we've never seen anything like North Korea, right? Like it's, it's if you want your citizens to basically to be the machine for the nation, for the uh, you know, ideas of the great leader, which is this absolute, absolute cult leader, then you really do need your citizens to be as, you know, they're not dumb, but all the information has to be stripped for them to not think critically. And that's one of the things I really, really began noticing about my students. When I said they seem much younger, in an abused world, you end up, you, because you never make decisions on your own. 
You're never being taught things that could make you wonder about the outside world, which might want to make you leave. You know, we're talking about the possibility of peace, which would suggest possibly reunification. This population that you're talking about, whose star students are so cut off from the world, do you, can you see these two populations integrating, reintegrating, discovering each other, working with each other? I don't mean to influence the debate that's coming up, but... Don't go too far with that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. I don't see a... a I mean at the people level. I'm mean, not the political decision they're going to debate, but at the personal level. Personal level, I mean, I think that it's a re rehab process. You know, I think that people think it's very simple. You reunify and suddenly everybody's happy. No, people who've been abused for 70 years and three generations need a trauma, you know, therapy that will take another generation. It's, I thought it was really irrevocable with well, the damage that's been done to them psychologically. The title of your book is? Without You, There Is No Us. Which means, which comes from? One of the most popular songs in North Korea because it's only the great leader that owns everything in that world. He alone can fix it. And yeah, without but, him. Yeah, without him, it's, there's yeah. There's nothing. Suki Kim, thank you so much for, for setting the table for us in this fantastic way. Thank you.